Hello and welcome to the Eco Business Podcast. I'm Robin Hicks, Deputy Editor of Eco Business, Asia's leading sustainability publication. On today's podcast, which is sponsored by Dan Foss, we're talking about cold chain and what it could mean for food security. Cold chain technologies have enabled sellers to keep food fresh and consumers to buy food from countries on the other side of the world. In the developing countries where a lot of the food we eat is produced, it's possible to help farmers increase their income while reducing the amount of food lost with proper cold storage equipment and post-harvest management. On this podcast, we're going to ask, how can cold chain technology ensure better and more secure food for generations to come? Joining us today are Graham Dixie, Executive Director at Grow Asia, a non-profit that works to improve sustainability in agriculture, and Dexter Huerto, Segment Marketing Manager for Asia Pacific at engineering firm Danfoss. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Nice to be here. Pleased to be here. Great to have you. So I'll kick off for the first question um, in our discussion about cold chain for you, Dexter. First of all, for the uninitiated, what is it? What's your definition of cold chain? I think the best way to define a cold chain is if we look at it visually. So for example, I go to a local grocery store um, or a supermarket store and I pick up a, a, a bag of, of bananas. And you read from the bag of bananas that it was produced in somewhere from Philippines or in India. So the next question that comes into mind is, how did, this, how did I receive this bag of bananas? I'm standing in Singapore. So obviously that banana had to be farmed from Philippines. It had to go some, to, through some post-harvest uh, activities. They had to store them and kept it at a specific temperature to maintain that banana's integrity. Then they had to move it thousands of kilometers via the sea. Then it had to go through a container ship, then to a van, to another store, a controlled store, until it goes to the grocery. Uh, grocery shop. So if you link, if, if you look at that entire chain of events, there's one thing that ties them together, and that's what you call the cold chain. That's why it's called a cold chain because there needs to be a strong link between the handover of the of the perishable product um, from the farm to the next holder to the next holder until it reaches the, the the grocery store, and that link of activities needs to be in a temperature controlled environment which is usually driven by refrigeration that's why it's called cold chain so it's basically another means of saying a supply chain but in a deeper sense it needs to be temperature controlled and um, from 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 where we are right now we think that the cold chain is evolving especially from from Asia perspective um, and we think it's in a good position right now um, but there's still a long ways to go mm, okay is that how you see it as well Graham what's your definition a grow Asia's definition of, of cold chain. Anything to add to that? I thought what Dexter said lays out the infrastructure and the, the sort of storyline. Maybe if I just add a little bit of um, nuance around it, to, just for the listener to understand how it's used in different ways. There's one use which is to extend the life of a product into the off season. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there you think about apples and potatoes being being sold at a time that they're not being produced. So that's long-term storage. And then there's another one which Dexter has particularly uh, concentrated on is the one of about extending the shelf life and lowering the bacterial burden. So things keep going just, but this is aren't very much a marketing tool. And then you find that there are all sorts of nuances within that around whether that's about chiller for milk or transport. Um, refrigerated transport or just now you've got a thing sufficiently cool you can keep it insulated and you can move it that way and retain its temperature so that's sort of um, a sort of sketch map of some of the nuances within the cold chain yeah okay so grow asia is very heavily involved in developing markets um, in asia pacific Um, so my question for you graham is is um what is the cold chain infrastructure like in developing asia and why is it so underdeveloped Mm. Well, I think the first thing to say is it's very variable. Um, you know, you've got somewhere like Singapore, which is about as developed as it gets. And then you have somewhere like Myanmar or parts of India where it is, is really struggling. Um, and it struggles for a number of reasons. Um, one is that the basic requirement is that you have a reliable supply of electricity. If you don't have that, then you have to go into generation and there's a little bit of movement into um, solar power. So that, that's a huge problem. If you haven't got reliable supplies, it just is a bit difficult to run it. The, the, and then the, the, tra- the distance of being transporting, um, and then the ones that um, uh, develop on, on top of that is um, the different 
types of product that you put into it. So there are some products um, which are particularly important that they need to be cold storage. And I've indicated, you know, things like potatoes and, and apples, you can extend the season from months and, and open much manure opportunities. And they tend to be in the production zones. And then there's cold storage, which is nearer the consumer, which is to keep the product fresh for sales through the more sophisticated consumer patterns. There are also things around the consumer. Some consumers actually have a cultural preference for warm meat, um, et cetera. So, uh, so you've got very big differences in, in how it's operated around the region. And you've got interesting things emerging. Um, you know, and a very in interesting example has been the bulk chiller for milk. Uh, as people become wealthier, their consumption of animal proteins goes up. And one of the big growth areas is in milk. You have to keep milk below certain temperatures, otherwise the bacterial load builds up. And so that what they have been creating is bulk chillers for individual farmers to deliver their milk to one particular location so the milk tanker can come by, which is not itself interest, uh, um, refrigerated, but it's sufficiently insulated that it can transport that milk back to the factory for processing before the temperature rise comes up. That's interesting. So, so Dexter, on that point as well of, of developing um, Asia and the cold chain, and why is it so under, underdeveloped? Perhaps you'd like to build on the challenges of, of, of cold chain in developing Asia. Um, I think the, uh, you know, developing Asia is a lot of, uh, faced with a lot of challenges. And it's more, as, as you mentioned, just to add from what you said, it's a lot of structural challenges and cultural norms. Hmm. Um, and you touch on, on a lot of that. And basically, whatever you see in terms of infrastructure would basically reflect the technology, what they're using, the infrastructure, what they're using, even the level of awareness towards the cold chain. So um, from a structural point of view, the cold chain integrity lies on two things. Um, one is connectivity and one is the energy source, which you have alluded to. So number one, that would be the readiness and the reliability of the transport networks. For example, you live in a country like Philippines, where it's separated between 7,000 islands. If you want to move the food that you have captured, for example, fish from one island to another, that's going to be a hell of a, a, hell of a, a struggle. Um, so usually what countries would do in that kind of, a, uh, kind of, of situation is that they would put um, 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 ice making machines in smaller islands so that, the, so that the ship can go to one island, load some ice, Mm. Once that ice is, is gone, then goes to another island until it reaches the, 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 national ca the, the capital region. So again, the correlation of food quality and food wastage is very much reliant on how long it is and how far. Um, and that increases the, the risk of food wastage. And then and another one and how we are um, uh, deeply involved is refrigeration. As, as Graham mentioned, you, know, you, you need to have electricity 24-7 to run uh, a re refrigerator at home which means that it's equal as important to have, if you have a, a larger facility, you need to have, you know, and have enough, enough capacity. And in, in areas where you have very prone for power outages and also non-reliable electric supply, that's also a, a huge ta challenge for, for, for the region. Um, but what we see in the next three to five years time, um, you know, Asia Pacific, uh, particularly ASEAN, there will be a lot more population and there will be changes in terms of of the, the food habits or the food preference and also where they want to buy. Um, Graham touched about wet um, wet uh, meat, uh, sorry, um, uh, warm meat, uh, sorry about that. I come from that place. I come from that place where 70% of the trade is still being done in wet markets. Mm. So um, although the food preference are changing, you have larger retail shops opening, um, all of these will be driven by the cold chain in the near future. And what I think that's gonna happen is that um, government stakeholders and a larger portion, a lot of, much of the private sector will be more involved. Um, and I think that will drive the cold chain. So to answer, answer your question, maybe not so much underdeveloped is that is not the right word to use, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of opportunity that we see. Mm. And what are the sort of environmental implications of not having a cold chain in place, Dexter? That, that question for you. And then perhaps build on what some of the benefits are of the cold chain. Yeah, sure. So um, if you think about planting food and raising food or raising animals, it takes a huge amount of resources. From the time that you plant it, it takes amount, uh, you know, a lot of water to raise that plant from the farm level, also the pro uh, processing level. Then you need fossil fuel to power the, uh, your refrigeration system and all the machinery that's involved. Then you need um, crude or, or gasoline or diesel so that you can transfer the food from one place to another via trucks. So all of these, 
added stress to the limited resources that we already have. And the important contribution of having a robust cold chain is that we're, you know, we're able to reduce food wastage where there's proper refrigeration, uh, the right practices are there. So this gives us some sort of a high level view. But I, I'd, I'd also come across some studies where it gives us a more, low, uh, more granular uh, view in terms of how having a cold chain can really improve the environment. And this is something that's happening in Southeast Asia. So for example, you have local fishermen and they're using the right cold chain program so to able to reverse the um, unsustainable effects of, 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 un, uh, of, of uh, for example, blast, blast um, uh, fishing or cyanide fishing. All of these are unsustainable fishing practices. So over the years, what has happened in Asia is that, you know, Asia having a lot of marine resources and seafood, the prices of the, of the seafood has also increased. And as that increased because of the demand of the region, what happens to these um, um, uh, fishermen is that they would rely on these unsustainable practices so that they can get more yield. So what the government did was that they stepped in, they built the right cold chain infrastructure. And what happened is that by building the cold chain infrastructure, that took care of the yield or the, or the amount of harvest that they can get. So instead of the, the fishermen trying to capture as much as they can, they rely on the cold chain to make sure that whatever they fish now is still the same amount as they go in the market. So if they capture what 100 kilograms of fish or whatever, 1,000 mm. kilograms of fish, by the end, once it reaches the customer, it's still around 1,000 kilograms of fish. So, so I think that's, that's a huge um, importance of, of, of the cold chain. So what we see is that there's a higher interest in the market for having more sustainable, for example, fishing. Mm. We'd like to build on that, Graham. The, again, the, ben the benefits of the cold chain. Well, I mean, so you've got the long-term um, storage. And what that does is enable product to be delivered out of the main season, which increases the sales capacity. So that if you are a potato producer, if you're just selling them in September and October, you've got a two-month market. But if you've now got a 10-month market, mm -hmm. you can produce five times the amount. So that's one. The second one is the point that you've been raising there about the, the cold chain and actually reducing the losses. And the fact that it's used, as you put, indicated with those fishermen, to modulate the marketing so you deliver the same amount. And you get... The third one is kind of interesting, and it's only recently been really sort of brought out by some of the studies, is the public good or the public bad effect of bad food. Um, there, there's been a, a recent study done by the World Bank in order to bring people's attention to what are the... Is, is the problem of food safety. Um, and they've put a number on it. They've actually done these kind of calculations and they say it's actually $95 billion a year of, of lost productivity because people are ill because of food-related diseases. That's a global so, figure. That's okay. a global figure. But the top four of the five countries are Asian, interestingly, in terms of the numbers. You know? um, so, th and... The, then they did an interesting calculation that was, you know, how, um, can we work, can we kind of benchmark what are the acceptable levels? So they do it in terms of for every hundred dollars you spend on food, how much loss of productivity happens because of food illness? And, and the, the ratio in a developed society is for every dollar invested, half a dollar is the cost of the food illness. In a developing country, it's about two to three percent. In other words, it's five or six times the level. And the interesting thing is where the problem is most, most problematic. It is in the emerging economies where the consumption of animal proteins are going up. And there is a lag before the infrastructure and the policies and the regulations are put into place. And that's where the major problems are occurring. So it's very much in the emerging economies, the sort of Vietnams, the Philippines, the Indonesias of the world, whereas Korea, Japan and, uh, and Singapore and Hong Kong are pretty well sorted about that. You mentioned, again, developing nations. Um, but the problem with cold chain technology is it's not cheap. Right. What are the sort of financing, again, question for you, Graham, the sort of financing options that are available in developing countries and the sort of solutions that are being talked about at the moment to finance cold chain technology? Well, I'm, not, I'm going to re reply in, in two, two forms. I mean, one is that clearly the requirements for cold storage in developing countries are different from where you are providing cold storage in a developed society. So one is that the designs tend to have much stronger insulation. So that if, 
your electricity doesn't last, it cuts off for eight hours, you, you don't lose your product. They are also increasingly going into um, alternative energy sources such as solar and so on and so forth. Um, so high insulation and alternative energy sources is, is one of the designs. They tend to be modular. Um, and we have seen some clever use, uh, particularly of, of secondhand refrigerated containers as a way of adapting that. The problem with a refrigerated container is one of the key things you have to do with cold storage is take the heat. The quicker you can take the heat out of something, the longer is the shelf life. You know, the rule of thumb is for, for every um, hour that it's not, you, you lose 10 hours of shelf life the other end. And that's where you have a real energy load. So the pre-cooling becomes very important. Turning to the issue of finance, some of the companies have their own financing set up to be able to enable that. But if we talk now into the public sector, um, a, a very interesting example is India, which basically provided 25% grant for people investing in cold storage and 33% in the least developed areas. What that kickstarted was the massive expansion of potato long-term storage in Bihar, one of the poorest places in, in India. So, you, they, they, And that, that got people to realize this was a good investment. And you've subsequently seen all sorts of innovations of those cold store owners working out ways that they can hire out space to farmers, that they bring in the traders. So this is the trading platform. And they even provide um, what's called um, storage credit. In other words, they will say, well, OK, you, 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 I'm looking after your potatoes now. I'm going to give you 50% into the value to tide you through that before you sell it and then we'll work out with the trader. So there are some very smart solutions coming out. Turning on to the sort of finance, there are um, sometimes you see um, specific grants put in place as I've talked about, but there's also financial instruments. Sometimes they set up dedicated funds specifically for banks to loan money to people who want to invest in cold storage, either at a blended or lower interest rate, or they give them fiscal advantages, saying you know, if you build a cold store, you don't have to pay tax for five years. So those are sort of some of the financial instruments that you tend to see. Interesting. Dexter, um, any view on financing from your perspective, particularly in the, in the context of developing countries, the more interesting solutions that you've noticed? I think Graham has, was able to touch it in more detail um, in terms of the financing, but I'd rather um, go on a different, on the other side of, of, uh, of financing um, and really look at in terms of partnerships and how partnership has pretty much helped the region in terms of developing the cold chain. So basically we see partnership between various sectors that it often leads to growth um, and also financing in one form or another. And that being said, you have international partnerships had has had success in, in in Asia. For example, for Philippines, you have local grow local growers of swine um, working with international um, agencies, and they were able to grow their business and export their 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 um, um, their, their products. Uh, because I think this is a more sustainable approach. Because as um, apart from the financial aid that they're getting, they're also getting exchange for knowledge transfer. You, know, you have a technology transfer, you have sharing of food safety and best practices of the cold chain. So I think this is a more sustainable approach. And, and, and as I mentioned, you know, these partnerships would always lead for opening of new opportunities, not just locally, but to the export market where there is you know, higher value for your commodity. Um, on a local level, what also happens is that I've seen examples where larger, um, um, cold, uh, larger um, supermarket operators they're now opening their uh, their existing um, facilities, such as their distribution hubs, their freezing facility, to, to the smaller farmers. So what I'm trying to say is that um, yes, financing is very important, but I think partnership is equally important um, for you to um, grow the business, um, especially for small small farmers. Interesting. I'm just going to get on to smallholders. Actually, again, back to you, Dexter. Um, what are the cold chain options available specifically for smallholder um, farmers and operators? Yeah, I'll probably speak from from experience from our from our um, India operations, um, and uh, there's a lot of. Uh, Things that that the the India or our India organization has done to help the local farmers, um, specifically for two key products. Uh, one is um, bananas, and one would be the dairy sector, which uh, Graham was mentioning about. So this um, two key products, I'd like to touch more or explain more about about dairy. And uh, basically, the way that milk is collected is through you know bulk chillers. So what happens is that you have a majority of the household. You have you probably have a handful of cattle. 
or a handful of cows. And what they do is they would collect it and they would bring it to a central collection facilities where they would have a, a, a bulk chiller. Um, and what is important is that this milk should be kept at a very precise temperature of around four degrees. Um, anything lower than you have chances of contamination, uh, sorry, anything higher you have chances of contamination, anything lower, the milk may freeze, which is a, which is a, which is a troublesome uh, problem. Mm. So what, what we were able to do is we were able to work with the local key stakeholders to develop the right type of solutions um, so that we could prevent this type of, 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 uh, of occurrence happening. So this example shows you that not just the right technology will lead you to a better cold chain, but you need to have the right stakeholders. And I think most importantly is that you need to have the best interest of the farmers. I think that's the most critical. You need to have the best interest of the farmers so that your program would be a success. Mm -hmm. Graham, smallholders obviously grow Asia is heavily involved in that segment. Anything else you'd like to add Ooh, about? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I wanted to build a little bit on what yes, Dexter was sure. saying about the milk sector, because the milk sector in India is fascinating. This is, an, this is a vegetarian society. So the coolest place for you to go if you want to eat more animal protein is milk. So it, the demand is going up. Traditionally, the milk waller, who's the guy who goes out on his bicycle to pick up the milk, will only collect milk from people in the immediate vicinity around a city. What those bulk chillers are talking about is create a whole new area that the tankers can go out and collect milk. And so it's, it's in, increased the livelihoods of people that are beyond the normal catchment area or market shed. Um, and the this is one of the greatest stories of international development. The, the millions of people that they have improved their livelihoods, their health of their children, simply by what is called Operation Flood. And the, in India is, you know, I think it's about the biggest producer of milk in the world now. So that's, that's how a bulk chiller like that can really be transformative. Um, I, I've got a, a fascinating story about fish. So this is again from India, but um, fish consumption is going up and fish consumption particularly from, um, there's, there's not much more going to come out of the sea, so aquaculture is where it's going. Mm -hmm. And there's one state in India called Andhra Pradesh which is the volume producer of fish. And you find Andhra Pradesh in fish all over the country. And you wonder, how do they get around? So I'm standing in Pune market. It's 40 degrees. It's seriously hot. And a lorry comes in that looks like it's got a haystack under a tarpaulin on its back into the fish market. They peel back the tarpaulin. And underneath that is a meter and a half of rice husks. And another tarpaulin, which was over um, fish boxes, top dressed with crushed ice. And this has been traveling one and a half days, but they're still traveling up to three days using local um, immediate technology solutions. I mean, you know, one of the problems there is at exactly that point about, I hope the water was clean when they started. But, you know, what that did was that it, without it, those Andhra Pradeshian fish farmers will only have been feeding the consumers Andhra Pradesh. Now they're reaching into Nepal, they're reaching into Assam. So that's the kind of sort of um, bigger story of where that can go and how it can transform things. And the bigger, the bigger picture is that throughout the world, people are moving away from farming and a significant proportion are becoming urban. So suddenly the farmer and the producer is much more distanced geographically from the consumer. So the whole of that post-harvest chain and how it's managed and the value added that could be put into it is being transformed. And we really need to be on top of that particular case because what it's like today is going to be very different from what it's going to be like in, in 10 years' time. Absolutely. I'd like to ask you a question about regulation. Oh, Graham. Um, so how can, what sort of role can regulators play in encouraging um, cold chain development and ensuring that the technologies um, get to the people that need it the most? Yeah. Well, th the first thing to say is actually, in my experience of regulators and policymakers, is that they misunderstand the problem. That they will see tomatoes being thrown away and say, so what we need is cold storage for tomatoes. Um, and you often see this being that they have put up cold storage specifically for tomatoes. Um, but actually, the reality is that if there's a glut of tomatoes and you put the glut into a cold store, the next day there will be another glut. So now you've got the fresh tomatoes plus ones that you've spent money on in the cold store to keep them going. Or the other solution they come up is that processing will be the answer. 
neither of those work. It's much, much more sophisticated. So they need to understand what the kind of issues. The long-term storage is one. The, the, the cold chain, which is critical to keep it cold all the way, pretty well along the way, um, is another. And then there are these, as I've alluded to, some of those public instruments, the grants to kickstart a new industry, to, to enable um, the private sector to get overcome that initial risk um, until people recognize that this is a business model which can work. And then there are some of those ones around fiscal and um, uh, using development funds to be able to provide um, in lower interest rates or specific funds specifically for um, the infrastructure. I mean, just, you know, there'll be just for a second to think about this, that we, that into, in the period between 1860 and 1960, per 100,000 people in the world, about 600 would die of famine. Since 1960, the figure is about 13. So there's been a huge improvement. And part of that is around productivity improvement. But the other half is this whole infrastructure. The fact that we've got roads that work, we've got cold storage that we can move from places of, of oversupply to areas of things. So it is a huge story. Indeed, yeah. And partly, obviously, um, the role of regulation in, in promoting yeah. that, yes. So Dex, anything you'd like to add on the role of regulation in, in ensuring a cold chain uh, is dispersed? So I think, I think what has happened in the, in the in the past decades is that it has proven that the that food is no longer a commodity, uh, not just a commodity. For example, in Asia and India, you know, governments and regulators now understand that the value of food not just a commodity, but it's actually an engine for growth for the economy. Let me give you two examples. You have countries like Thailand and, and um, Korea. So these two uh, these two countries went back to food as a pillar. Uh, so that food is a pillar of the economic growth. So you have Thailand 4.0, then you have Korea also having their own programs. And these are countries that are largely uh, already at the industrial side of things. They like they produce cars, they produce TVs, they produce mo mobile phones, but now they're going back to food because they've, they, they have now figured out that food is something that will always be there. And that um, while other industries are slowing down, food will always be on the uptrend. So, and you also have India, which has a huge population, and we have already talked about uh, all of the, the, the agriculture and all the, the capacity that it can produce. India is also focusing on the cold chain. So going back to your question, I think, yes, the government has a huge role. The regulators has a huge role. But I think to cut it short, specifically for small farmers, I think the main role of the regulators is to reduce the barrier of entry for them to use a cold chain. Um, whether there's simple technology, or advanced technology, small farmers should have access to it. Whether it's financial instruments or financing, tax, uh, tax incentives, they should have access to it. And another one would be tr proper training education. Um, mm. So as, as, as uh, Graham did mention, it doesn't need to be rocket science. You have your, your uh, hay and, uh, and tarpaulin. Um, that's a, a possible solution, but there's always room for educating the smaller um, farmers that there are, you know, there are means to produce your, uh, to, to keep your capital. Um, there are means that to make sure that your products is, is not wasted. So I think it's, again, it's a bright future for the cold chain. Final question for you chaps. Um, what do you see as the future of food and the role of cold chain within it? Mm -hmm. um, there's a, uh, for if you look at at, at Asia at, at Asia Pacific or maybe ASEAN um, to be more to be more exact, a lot of people are moving now to the to the to the city centers. So, for example, if you're living in a country in in, in Indonesia, a country of 250 260 million people, how many 60 percent would be living in Jakarta in the central business district? Same thing for Philippines, a country with more than 100 million, almost 30 percent would be living in 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 Manila. So at the same time, when that is happening. Um, things become more busy. Um, people would now have higher in, uh, disposable income. They would have, um, they would want to experience more things out of their of that of their income. Whether they want to try the wagyu beef from wherever place, or they want to try a, a new white asparagus from somewhere else. So things will change. The preference of consumers will change, and um, the cold chain will always be dragged into this discussion. Because for those things to come into fruition, um, a robust cold chain is necessary. And I think, for example, we're living in Singapore. It's a small red dot. We don't have any capacity to produce food, but we are living in a, in, in a very um, uh, good state whereby there's food security. 
there's food quality and there's food diversity. Maybe just by a click of a button if you wanted to. So I think that's the direction that we're heading. Okay, Graham, future food. Uh, sorry, well, the I future think food. I think covered it really well. I mean, that, you know, the urban consumer is a different consumer and they're growing massively. And the economies are growing. So that there is this quirky thing called Bennett's Law, which basically, as people get wealthier, they, their consumption of the staples declines or flattens, and their consumption of uh, high-value high fruit and vegetables goes up, starts with vegetables and then fruit. Then you've got the animal protein consumption shooting up, and then you've got the movement into processed um, products. Um, the urban consumer tends to be at the front edge of that, so much more animal proteins, but particularly on the process side. Um, they, they, the, the expression often used is um, cash rich, time poor. So that they are much, the, 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 the consumption levels um, are changing, um, but they're also much higher consumption of service provided food, restaurants um, or semi-prepared foods sort of chilled foods and so on and so forth tend to be the way that that particular grows. And as, as, as Dexter has alluded to, the producers are now geographically distant and, and culturally different distance from the demand. So actually making that linkage happen and that the post-harvest systems that need to be in place to link the producer to the consumers is um, going to be an increasing issue going forward. Great place to leave it. Graham, Dexter, thanks very much for joining the Eco Business Podcast. This podcast was hosted by Eco Business at the SDG Co, a co-working space for sustainable development organizations in Asia. Eco Business is the leading digital media company serving the region's sustainability community. This episode is part of the podcast series Tomorrow's Cities Engineering the Energy Transition, which is supported by Dan Foss. Dan Foss engineers energy efficient and smart technologies, which enable the world of tomorrow to do more with less. Join the conversation by visiting eco-business.com, follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.